would like to introduce all of you to Dr. Victor Lobetsky from Hunter College of the City University of New York. Um, we met last year when Dr. Bobetsky wrote to me and asked me to collaborate with him and some other authors on a book, We Shall Overcome, essays on a great American song about the music of the civil rights movement. And then I was invited to come up to New York back last February in the snow. I got to go up there and speak about that music up at Hunter College. And while I was there, we were talking about all the wonderful things that he does in music education. So I asked if he would return the favor and come down here to us to talk to all of you. So we have a wonderful workshop planned for you and another one tonight where we're gonna read through some of his compositions that we've gotten in from different publishers and talk specifically about middle school voices. But right now, our focus is gonna be on you as educators, finding jobs and keeping jobs and uh, all those great things that you need to know. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I wanna thank you for inviting me to talk with you and get to know you today. When Dr. Weber came to Hunter College to give a, um, a talk about the Albany Freedom Movement and the Albany Freedom Singers, it was a great experience for us at Hunter because not too many people in the New York region are that familiar with that aspect of the Civil Rights Movement. And the history of it comes right from this city, right from this town. And she really opens our eyes to a, a story and a, a history that we were not aware of. And she made a perfect uh, fit with the panel discussion that we had. So it, it was a pleasure to get to know her. And now it's a pleasure to come and, and visit all of you. Let me get to know you just for a couple of minutes so that I can help to uh, tailor this talk to the actual people who are in this room. Uh, how many of you right now are student teaching? Raise your hand if you're student teaching right now. Okay, so most of you, all right, how many are in the music education program but are not yet student teaching in the early stages of, okay, good, good, thank you. How many are music majors, not necessarily music education majors? All right, whom have I left out? Speak and tell me who you are, if there's anyone. Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. All right, four of, yeah, good. Okay, let me tell you a very little bit about myself, and we're gonna go right into a workshop which I hope is going to be helpful to you in terms of finding, uh, interviewing for, and succeeding at the first year on your job. I started out as a concert pianist, went into teaching, uh, taught in junior high school 51 in Brooklyn, New York, middle school chorus and general music, and eventually ended up supervising music teachers in different cities and towns. And then for the past 14 years, um, I've been at Hunter College directing the music education program, where I do basically what uh, Dr. Henley and uh, Dr. Weber do um, in terms of supervising student teachers and placing them in jobs and running the courses that have to be run. Um, I think my experience as somebody who's taught and looked for jobs for myself and also as someone who's hired teachers uh, in Columbus, Ohio and West Hartford, Connecticut and East Meadow, New York where I was supervisor of the arts for the cities there um, gives me a, a perspective from both sides of the table, uh, the side of the interviewee and the side of the people who were hiring. So uh, I'm hoping that what I have to share with you, you will find helpful. Let's get started. Most likely, when you apply for a job, you're going to be applying for a particular advertised job that you heard about in a school system, in the newspaper, in MENC, uh, I'm sorry, NAFME. How, how many of you are members of National Association for Music Education? Great, that makes you automatically members of the state music Education Association, which gives you access to job banks, uh, to leads, uh, which gives you reduced um, rates at conferences where you can go and hear about jobs at the job centers, and that's a very important uh, avenue that you should explore. Um, there are also sometimes, especially for my students in New York State, in New York City particularly, 
where you have to apply in a blanket kind of way. Uh, if you look at an area and you say, I really want to teach in Florida, or I want to teach in Atlanta, or I want to teach wherever, uh, then you do research and you find the uh, ways to send your resumes to the geographical area that you're interested in. I'm very curious, out of the people in this room who are contemplating being music teachers, uh, raise your hands if you think that uh, you would end up looking for a job in this general area, in the Albany general area. Okay. How, okay. Uh, it's not a large area. Okay, so there are a few. How many in Georgia in general? More, more expanded? Uh huh. All right. Good. And how many <coughs> beyond Georgia? <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Anybody for New York? Look at that. All right. So I'll have to give you my card or whatever. Okay, in New York? Okay. All right. Okay. So that's good. You're looking all around where you need to do. And now I can talk more about blanketing, uh, blanket resumes and cover letters because I see that some of you may be interested in doing just that. Uh, so your cover letter could either be in response to a particular job opening or just exploring a region, a city, a state that you want to uh, teach in, possibly. So what would you say? is the purpose of a cover letter. What would you say is the purpose of a cover letter, if I were to ask you? And you can tell me your name, so uh, hopefully we can get a little interpersonal here. Uh, my name is Maurice Biggins. Uh, basically, the cover summary, I mean, the cover page is basically a brief summary of, of the accomplishments you have made. Yeah, it is. It's a brief summary of the accomplishments. Uh, what else is it? What's the purpose of it besides that? I mean, because it's one page, basically. Um, is it kind of to like sell yourself real quick, but not like overdo it, but kind of just sell yourself to make them interested in you? Yeah, I, I, like, I like both answers. The um, selling yourself, making yourself stand out from the crowd is a very important <laughs> point. When I was a director in Long Island, in East Meadow, and we had a music vacancy, we would have hundreds of resumes and cover letters. And that was before computers and the secretaries from the personnel office would get their exercise. They would come down the hall with a big pile of resumes and they'd drop them on my desk and I'd say, oh no, you know, now I have to read all these resumes and cover letters. But the thing is, you have to realize that most employers are deluged with resumes and cover letters. And the first thing that they want to do is to separate the ones that they might consider from the ones that they would never consider. The trash can is there. It's very convenient. And uh, they look through and they have to make quick decisions and they have to make a short list of who it is that they would be willing to approach and possibly get to know further through interviews, through demo lessons. So like you say, the, uh, the cover letter is the key to staying in to the process. You have to make them want to read your resume. That's what the cover letter is all about. You have to make them want to read uh, the resume. And if you can include something that's unique about you in music, that's very helpful because it makes you stand out from the crowd. Um, what should go into it and what should it look like? Well, we've already established, I think, that it should be concise and that it should be to the point. One page is definitely enough. And it should be related to the job being advertised. If you're looking for a high school position in Franklin Roosevelt High School in New York, uh, then, and it's been advertised, your cover letter should say, I would like to apply for the position of band director at Franklin Roosevelt High School. Uh, it should be very direct. It should reference exactly the position uh, that you're responding to, if you're responding to a particular advertised position. We'll talk about the other side of it in a minute. But for a particularly advertised position, you start out that way. I would like to be considered for the position of choral director at Maryland High School. All right. Uh, something unique about you and your background. We had a wonderful application once from someone who was a uh, visiting artist to uh, a Suzuki Institute in Japan. He had played violin since he was nine years old. And he told us about that in uh, a short paragraph. And I said, I want to hire this person because he's really a specialist in the Suzuki method, and he's bridged the gap. He's gone to Japan. He's worked with the people there. You know, this is somebody that I'd really be interested in. Whatever it is that is unique about 
your experience in music. Whatever you think you do well in, whatever you think you're fascinated by, you should put that in your cover letter briefly, something unique about you. And of course, the cover letter and the resume should be very professional in appearance. Use good resume paper, make the outlines neat. We're going to go over some sample resumes. You'll see some things that are good, and then maybe you're going to tell me some things that are not so good later on in this session. Uh, so professional appearance of the letter. And uh, generally, you can say at the end, uh, I would welcome the opportunity to, uh, to interview in, in your school. And my references are available upon your request to me. Thank them for their interest. And that's it. That's the first move. Uh, you don't want to send them unless they want these things. Tons of references, uh, letters along with this. This is, the, this is the key to opening the door. And it's the beginning of the process. So you want to stand out. Uh, you want to make it clear that you're advertising, uh, that you're responding to the particular advertisement that you're responding to, if that's the case. And, uh, and just very clear and professional, and stop right there. If you're blanket, if you want to go to New Jersey, and you decide that you want to go to uh, Trenton, or to Newark, or to uh, Saddle River, or wherever you want to go there, then what you should do, obviously, is uh, research, find out who's the director of music, if there is one in those districts, find out what schools that you'd like to consider, get the names of the principals, and then you should really send all of these people within the geographic area you'd, you'd consider your cover letter and your resume, and then personalize it. Uh, you know, I, I would very much like to work in the Trenton, New Jersey schools. I would very much like to work in Saddle River, New Jersey, so that you're constantly customizing your cover letter, just as you would for an advertised position when you blanket a geographical area or a particular school. It, the message has to be, there's nowhere else I want to work except your school, mm -hmm. in your school district. This is where I want to be. I, 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 I very much want to work for Pennsylvania schools, okay, whatever it is. Uh, make sure that you show that interest. So, okay, cover letter, I didn't bother to make copies because I basically just went through the things that, uh, that really make a good cover letter. Um, now, let's look at the resume. I'm going to write a couple of things on the board now that I had the marker. And as I do that, I want you to think about any question you might have about a cover letter that I didn't address. Any questions? Uh, that means I explained it well. All right, good, good. OK, thank you. You're a very good group. Now, um, these are the categories that I tell my students to include in their resume. There are many ways of writing an effective resume, and there is no one truth. But I think this method has been effective for me and my students, so I share it with you. Very often, resumes are written starting with a business world-like sentence. Uh, if you apply for a job as an executive in a company, or for a manager at Penny's or something, you're going to say uh, something like, my goal is to, uh, to, to, to make the workplace more efficient and to, and to bring in uh, diverse groups of people into the marketing process. It, it's a long sentence. It's a lot of stuff. Um, when you try to do something like that in music education or in education in general, I think that it falls flat. And I like to see positions sought 
at the beginning of the resume so it's very clear. What are you looking for? Is it high school band director? Is it uh, any kind of music teacher pre-K through 12? Is it choral director? Is it elementary school general music? Whatever it is, you should make it very clear. And if you're willing to consider more than one possibility, you change it depending on the job. All right, you don't keep one resume that says uh, music teacher pre-K through 12, and then if there's a high school band opening, send them that letter, uh, you, 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 that resume. You, you change the heading and you say position sort high school band director so that you target it exactly to the position being advertised. Now, just to go to the other dimension, if you're doing the blanket resume, you want to teach in Colorado. Anybody want to teach in Colorado? <laughs> All right. Okay. Just in case you did, uh, you want to teach in Colorado, and then you would say possibly music teacher pre-K through 12 because you're interested in going there and you want to be open to the job possibilities that exist. If you're just canvassing, then you might not want to narrow yourself as much. Uh, bands, chorus, general music, etc. But certainly, whenever you apply to a particular position, make sure that the top of your resume says position sort, that kind of position. And you'd be surprised, the people who don't do that, when I was doing the hiring. And then you would look and you'd say, well, does this person really want this kind of job? Does this person really want to be a choral director? He or she didn't say so. It just said, music teacher. What kind of music teacher? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe they're just applying to everything. So it helps to be very, very clear, I think, in terms of the position sort. And then the education. List your education in reverse chronological order. Your teaching experience. Student teaching is teaching experience. So you list it. And you, you say student teacher, wherever it was, uh, and you might have a bullet or two about what you did. <coughs> Um, how many have had teaching experience other than student teaching? And let's see what kind you have. Oh, well, I've taught uh, piano lessons before. Then Is you. Kind of like a teaching experience? It's teaching. It's a, you, you taught studio piano. You taught studio piano. You taught private lessons in piano. You can list that under teaching experience. Um, I taught liturgical phrase and hymn uh, You can list that. It doesn't have to be only in a public school environment. Whatever you have at your stage of, of your career, uh, you put in. And uh, you, don't, you don't go on forever about it, but you put it in, and that way they know that you have that in your background. Performing experience, many of you, I'm sure, are performers. You've given a senior recital. You've done this or that. You can put that in under a category of performing experience if you have it. Uh, optional, I didn't put that in because it was optional. <laughs> Other experience. How many are coming to music education after maybe working for a year in some other kinds of job? Let me put it, yeah. You have? OK. What kinds? Uh, retail. OK. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Anyone else? Anyone else? What is the question? What is during school? You put that too? You can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like fast food and stuff? You can be. Well, that's not really. <laughs> I was mainly looking, you know, supposing you went into, now, the part time, I don't think you need to really yeah, do. But the, if, if, say, you had gone into another full time line of work for a year, and I happen to have a lot of students like that, I have career changers. Oh. I have some people who have, uh, you know, gone into uh, real estate. And, and then they want to go into music education because that's really what they wanted to do. So in that case, I have a category other experience. All right, for a part-time job, you know, unless it had to do with music or education, I'd probably pass. All right, uh, I don't think you'd get that much mileage for your trouble. Okay, but it's, it's good to think about everything that you can do. Uh, if you had managerial experience, maybe, but uh, I'm not even sure what I'd do with that. Uh, anyhow. There's an optional category there in terms of uh, full-time, more or less, work in another area. Um, most of you have gone straight from high school to college, and you're here, correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it. Um, Victor. Yeah. Um, some of them, I think, teach at local music stores. 
that is something that you can use. Would that go in teaching or, or other, or what, what do you think? Well, I would put it in teaching. Yeah, I would. You're teaching. You're teaching private lessons. You're teaching group lessons. I would definitely put it there. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, it would go there. Um, professional affiliations. We talked about NAFME. Uh, anybody a member by chance of any of the professional societies? The um, Kodai educators, the ORF educators. Another page. The members of Page and DA. What is that? Professional Association for Georgia Education. Okay, all right. Um, so you can put that in for professional affiliations. Honors and awards. Did you get a scholarship? Did you get a medal? Did you uh, get some kind of professional recognition in college? You list the award, you list the date. A scholarship, dean's list, whatever. You can list that under honors and awards. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, how far back? Would you say uh, would be appropriate to list on your um, resume, like as far as dates wise, like how far back would you really? Well, I would, you know, I would use I would use the college years primarily, and if you did something in music that w that you feel is exceptional and should be noted in the high school, uh, you can. I wouldn't put the high school. <coughs> under education, I just leave it at the college level. You know, basically I think, we'll, say you were a director of music in a church and you started at 16 years old, you know, and that's like a professional job, say you were the organist or the choir director, you could definitely list that under either teaching experience or other experience. Yes? Um, I was, a lot of times I find myself asking people how long a resume should be, and they always tell me on the business side it should be one page, but for music, how long should it actually be? I, that's a great question. I think that the ideal size for a resume is going to vary from person to person. But in general, for people who are in college and making their first resume, I encourage my students to condense it to one page. We do a lot of editing. Now, and that's not that we throw out important things, but we try to say those things with fewer words to try to make it one page. Sometimes they go into two. That's OK. I think more than two is excessive. I think if you get it right in the, in the one to two page uh, limit, you're doing the right thing. Any other questions? Would you list your, like, say in college you join organizations, would you list those? Such as? Like, I'm in finding your alpha. Would I list that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where would, it, where would you put it under? You could put it under professional organizations. Yeah. One, two. No? Okay. Well, what if it's an organization that's not um, catered towards music, but it is kind of like a, mm, like, yeah, kind of like healthy leadership, that kind of thing, or like, say if you in like SGA or something like that. I know it's not catered towards music, but it is, like, would you put it or would you not put it? Um, you could, that's a very good question. I didn't really make a category for you, um, but there <laughs> should be, no. but there should be. Uh, you can put that. Um, you could, if it's a college-related, academic-related thing, you could put it at the bottom of the education section. Okay, you could put it in the education section. Uh, you could put it into uh, other experience, or you could leave it in uh, in professional organization. I think either way, either of those would do okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what if you do like competitions in college and you get? Chairs or certain things, would you put that under performance experience or honors and awards? And tell me again, what, uh, clarify exactly what you mean for me. Um, like, all right, we go to the HBCU consortium, which is all the HBCUs, and basically you're battling for top bands and certain seats. If you win and you get a certain seat, like let's say you went first in symphonic or certain awards, would that go on performance or honors? Receive distinction of first mm -hmm. chair, you know, uh, date, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Good. All right. Uh, yes, think of all of those things uh, that you could put in. Any other question before we examine and critique some real life resumes from New York? <laughs> I know you said don't really mention high school like that, but what if you went to a performing arts in, like high school? It's your discretion. You can do it. If you think it's going to sell you, 
then you do it. If I have somebody who went to the Fame High School, LaGuardia High School, and they want to put it in, you know, I, in New York, I say go ahead and do it. If they went to uh, some ordinary high school in Brooklyn, you know, I, I, I said don't bother, you know. But if it's uh, if you feel it points in the direction that you want to uh, sell yourself, then you can add it. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. Any other question? All right, now let's get into these resumes here. Uh, you have your packet. Let me see who's first in your order. Who's first? Okay, all right, I see. Thank you. I want to start with. <laughs> A long one. JP. JP. Two pages. JP. It'll be front and back <coughs> in your package. Front and back. Mm -hmm. JP. I think it might be the last one. I think it is. Okay. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is look at the beginning of the resume. <coughs> What's he missing? Position Thank you. Position sort. We don't know what this guy wants. <laughs> and he doesn't either. He ended up in London, uh, you know, so in, in real life. Uh, but uh, we don't know what he wants from this resume, so he really should put something for position sort. Uh, look at his education. Looks okay, tell me. I think it looks okay. All right. Then we have a category called experience. I would say teaching experience because that's what it is. Um, but now, go down to the bottom of the page and look at the last entry. Baldwin Wallace College Admissions Office student ambassador, uh, that's a good thing to do. Uh, is that teaching experience? No. So what can we, what can we categorize that as? Other experience. Other experience. Okay, all right. So that's what we have. Everything else in the teaching experience that I just made column uh, seems to be worthy of teaching. But don't go anywhere because we're going to critique this more. Uh, go back to the first item in teaching experience. I want you to look <clears throat> at the entry for this Veritas Academy in Queens, New York. And I want you to tell me if you think there's any way this could be condensed or if there's anything in this entry that might be superfluous or expendable. The second bullet. Coordinated two field trips and chaperones for a hundred. Yeah, that's something. Uh, you know, yeah, he did it. But how significant is it? And is it something that anyone might do? And if you really love that entry, then just say coordinated field trips. Do we need to know 140 plus students? I mean, it gets too much if somebody is just reading this and wants to get an, a quick picture of you. I go back to bullet one, instructed 140 plus students in a high school music history curriculum. I might get rid of the number 140 plus, or I might leave it and let go of the remainder of the sentence. I would try to abbreviate as much as possible. Bullet three, coordinated school-wide assembly. Okay, I could see that. Um, but now, we'll go back to another resume that's much more brief in a minute. But look at his second entry, Education Through Music in Queens, New York. Victor, they may not know what the PS stands for. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> yeah. In New York City, we have so many elementary schools. We have thousands of elementary schools, so they go by number. PS1, PS2, public school, and they're elementaries. PS1, PS2, PS100, uh, you know, so that's what it is. Thank you. It's an elementary school. Uh, so 
anything there that you think might be condensed in any way? You could say that a comprehensive general music education is going to include vocal, instrumental, and music theory. And you might not have to say vocal, instrumental, and music theory. The only thing I'm trying to do is to get you into a mindset of editing, editing your own stuff so that uh, you make the point with as few words as possible. I was going to say the third uh, bullet, directing the 40 plus number, select chords consisting of fourth and fifth grades. What about it? Condense it. Just say uh, direct the choruses. You could well say uh, directed a, a 40 member chorus or directed a fourth and fifth grade chorus, you know, or you know, you could just append that to the first bullet, you know, and, and work in directed a chorus into that. All right, this is this is good. Victor, there's yeah. a question over to your left. I'm sorry, who has it? I was, I was about to point out the same thing, and he just pointed out about the, the third bullet. Good, good. Good. Let's go on to his second page. Professional affiliations is a category that I like to use. Here he has activities. Do these all go together? Are these all in the, all his activities basically the same category? No. no. They're all over the place, which is probably why he said ac activities. I would take professional affiliations and I would put the actors equity. I would put the um, uh, representative to the Hunter Graduate Music Curriculum Board. All right, maybe that could go in there. But athletics and, uh, and performing, uh, that really needs, to, the athletics can go somewhere else, but the performing experience needs a category because he's American Idol. He's a featured singer for the Ohio Governor's <laughs> inauguration. He really should have a category of professional experience, this uh, performing experience. This guy did a lot, so it should be noted. He really needs a two-pager. He's got enough to do with two-pager, but he could still edit the way we talked about. And then he has skills where he includes everything. You know, he's got Spanish and French. You could make a category languages language proficiency, and you could put Spanish and French. Um, at a certain point, you have to stop. Um, then you can have skills, and you can have the computer skills, Microsoft Office, Sibelius, GarageBand, all of that. But just categorize them with a little more precision so that you know what belongs to what. Okay, so that's his resume. You did a good job. Now, look at KS. What do you have to say about the format? Let's go one at a time, yeah? Um, I said it's more organized. Who else had something to say about the format? It's just a lot easier to read. It's more pleasing to the eye. Who else? It's the one page and it has all the categories in one page. Everything is in one page. Well, it looks like some of the, his points that he wants to stand out the most are bolded and underlined. Yes, it's, it makes it really easy for the eye to follow. What else? There's actually one thing that I think is hard on the eye. Can anybody? A lot of it is very small. It's true, it's small print. I'm thinking actually of something else. A lot of it is bolded, but that doesn't bother my eye. <laughs> is there anything else that might bother somebody's eye? Oh, 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 he's got it. The dates, how they're not lined up correctly. They're not lined up reasonably. He, the dates are in their own column, and then the column changes when you get to performance experience. And it changes again. And it changes again for professional. So that doesn't look that professional. So what I would suggest, I think this person has the content just right. But I think that the format is hard on the eye, and that it should be revised to uh, 
uh, to reflect that. Very good. They're very good critics. <laughs> They're good critics. All right. So now, I also have something with this resume. If you looked at it in detail, you would see that nothing was listed between uh, August of 2007 and January of 2008. Uh, so <coughs> what I would like to see is even if that person was just substituting, which I think was the case, uh, I would like to see that she would have put that in, uh, substitute teacher at PS1, PS2, PS3, wherever she was, uh, you know, just so that we know what she was doing. This was a person who took a while to get the certification. She was first a performance major, and then she went on to Hunter to become a master's in music education. But in what she did in Detroit, and then moving to New York, a little gap exists. And that's another rule uh, in terms of uh, if, if someone is, if it turns out that you take a year off before you teach, or something like that for whatever reason, and you do something else, um, acknowledge the gap in the resume and uh, put down what it is that you did. Maybe you needed to earn more money and you took a full-time job in another area like we talked about before. So then you would put that in other experience with the dates so that people know. Employers, or at least overly paranoid employers, probably like I was, will look at a resume and they'll look to see gaps. They want to see a gap. And then we say, well, why is there a gap? What, is that, what happens with that person? You know, is, is, this, uh, is this a good sign? Did they do nothing? You know, what, what's going on here? Uh, people who read resumes often want to see that every gap is filled in. Not part-time, but if, if, you do, if you don't go to school for a year, and if you don't have a, mm, a teaching job for a year, the question becomes, what did you do for that year? And I'm sure you did something, so you should put it in under other experience so that we know. But I think we're all in agreement that this is content-wise pretty decent. It, it focuses us. All right. So you have an example of that, and you know what's wrong with it so that you could fix it in your own case. Let's look at the third resume, which is LF. Mr. Um, I, have, I have a question. Sure. From, my, um, From your colleague? She said, um, what happens if someone had to take a year off because they um, had a child? Yeah, that you can list. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you would do first of all, you could you could mention it number one in the cover letter, okay, that you took a year off to uh, to have a child. You could you could do that, but in the resume, uh, you could. I, that's a good, very good question, and I'm thinking fast to give you the right answer. And I think that what you might do is uh, just even say other experience childcare. You know, I mean, say that. So that's, uh, I mean, because that's what it is. That's what it is. Say it. Say it. Yeah, yeah. That's what you say. You know, and, and then, then they don't have that question. Would you uh, submit the cover page and the resume together? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So now let's look at uh, LF. And let's look at his education. Good education. Let's look at his, oh, what comes next now? What is he missing? Position sort. Yeah, oh good, okay. So uh, then we have the education. Then why do we have now honors and awards? See, I would say put the teaching experience next because we, we're not so interested, uh, we, we're, we're interested, but we're not primarily interested in how many honors and awards you had but you're going to be a teacher. We're interested in your teaching experience. So go to the teaching experience first. OK, so let's do that. And then we'll look. We'll look at the first entry, music student teacher at Bryant High School in New York. Comment on the first bullet for me. Is there any, what, do, what do you think about the first bullet? And do you have any suggestions for, for potential editing of the first bullet? Anything come to mind? Yes? Um. He could take out the license part and the instrumental. I mean, he would take out the jazz part because jazz is good instrumental. That's just what I did on my on my draft. Yeah, take out licensed. 
because they better be licensed. Right. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, I'm not a good supervisor if I send them to an unlicensed teacher. So let, let's not bother with that. Uh, assist the school's band director, period. You know, I mean, I mean that's, that's enough, you know, really, for a student teacher. Look at the next, look at the next entry, PS 183. Comments again, somebody different. You're going to be good resume critiquers here. Somebody different. Bullet two. Take out the license again? Yes, what is this with the license? Okay, <laughs> take out the license. Um, anything else? <laughs> yeah. Uh, instead of saying music band and chorus, you can say, just say general music? Mm. Or, yeah, I'm on the fence. Help me out. What, what are some other opinions on that? Mm. Yeah, yeah? For that one, you could also just say band and chorus. Or like you said, general music. You know, it is different. Either, here's what I would do. Either I would just take out licensed and leave general music band and chorus, but I might take out with subjects including and just say with general music band and chorus. Right? And I could shorten it without losing anything important. Okay? So you got to be an editor when you make your resume. Combine and condense. The next two bullets, look at the one-to-one -one tutor, launch math and science center, and see if you have any comments. I have one. I want to see if you do. <laughs> see if we have the same comments. Take out. You don't have to. Hold on, wait. How many agree with that? Good. What else was said? Uh, I, I feel like everything after the comment. Right. Because it says that he's the math and science teacher in the bowl. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, very, it's very thick. It's right. very thick, right? Uh, what else? Yeah, I was going to say, if you didn't take out that whole bullet, you could take out the uh, happening with math tutoring because in the title it says math and uh, science too. Center. Yeah. Center. yeah, you're all, you could do two things, in my opinion. Num thing one, you could simply get rid of based on their academic background and necessities, and necessities is not even the right word there. Uh, needs is the right word. These are drafts, by the way. We made them better before they went out. I'm giving you the drafts, not the perfect versions, so that you can correct it. Um, or you could do what was also suggested, getting rid of the math tutoring because it's already implied that uh, it's a launch math and science center. I could leave, I could see leaving individual math, individualized math tutoring, although it's also redundant. So 100% get rid of based on their academic background and necessity. And 75% perhaps getting rid of the uh, individualized math tutoring. And already you've cut down a lot, okay? Next bullet, writing tutor, LaGuardia, Community College. It's not that bad. We could leave it. Anybody object to strenuously? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, an assistance with college level class assignments. I mean, say at college. So, yeah. Yes, with general writing and counseling, and and ass assistance with assignments, because we know it's college yeah, level. Sorry, college level. Yeah. So. You see how the words pile up, you know, when you don't really need them? Uh, good. All right, performance experience. Some of my students have, a, uh, well, they're, some of them are quite good, but uh, he's not afraid to let you know he's a national touring drummer, okay? And uh, he's got all this going on. Okay, so this is, this is good stuff. We can leave it. We can, we can have, uh, do we need to know in bullet two that it had over 800 competitors nationwide right now? No, no, not really. I think just top regional winner of national rock drumming competition says it all. Uh, fine. And that's the page of him that I gave in. So uh, you did a good job. You have any comments or questions after all? I think you really did well. You looked at three resumes. You oh. got a hand over oh. here. OK. Um, my other thing was about the format. Um, when you got to performance, performance experience, you change from, you know, bold title and bold document. Yes. Death. Good. What's your name? Justice. Oh. Okay. He has a very good point. 
look how the guy changed from bullets to like a hyphen. Why? He shouldn't do it. Keep it consistent. Yeah, this, this moved over, like format, the whole format changed on from this to Mm hmm So we could, could we say, keep the format uh, consistent throughout? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we could. And I think that would be what we want. All right, now we move on. What? He's got three different things. Okay, all right, okay, all right, all right. All right, okay. Now, interview process. Oh, okay, questions? I'm sorry, before you go to the next subject, I just had a question. I didn't know if you was going to ask the questions at the end, but I just wanted to ask it before you know, while we were talking about it. Can you get to the questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, She's okay. editing you. She's editing you. <laughs> um, I was in a session about resumes not too long ago, um, I think like last week, and they were talking about, well, it was a lady from Career Services where they um, do resumes, and she was saying about how nowadays when you upload a resume online, they have those different words that are put into a resume that will um, kind of, yeah, automatically uh, jump your resume to the top versus others. Like, have you ever heard of it? Okay. But tell me, what, what are they? I mean, I what are the words? Just, I'll, I'll put it in my resume. Just, um, I mean, it's specifically for like your major. Like, if it was, she was saying, like, if you're an accountant major, then you would use words based on that field. And like, different, like, education, ma education majors would use words based on education, like, in their profession. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like buzzwords. Yeah, buzzwords. That's the word I was looking for. It depends on if the person reading your resume likes buzzwords or not. You know, I mean, it's uh, some people, yeah, and we're going to go into that when we talk about philosophy of music education also. So it's a good question. Hold it for a little bit. <laughs> I'll get back to it. Was there another one? Yeah. I just have a comment on what Justin was just asking about. That uh, buzzword has to do when you haven't even gotten to the person yet. You're just uploading it and it's going through a computer system. And the computer system, right, Justin, right. Is, talking about, is going through and looking for words to see if your resume gets to a human being who's going to look at it. So if it's, if it's some huge uh, database, like, for instance, I talked to somebody that was looking for federal government jobs. And in that database, it does. It goes through and it looks for those words. Interesting. And then it'll send the top however many they want to look at to the personnel manager who will then look at them. It's worth learning about. It's what computers are doing to us. It's yeah. worth learning about. It's definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you uh, get ready to present your resume to the person you want to be hired from, should it, what kind of photo should it be in? Or is it a notebook? Or how would you do that? I would, well, first of all, you kind of probably end up emailing it as an attachment these days to most school districts. But if you're doing it the old fashioned way, it would just be on professional resume paper, eight and a half by 11, you know, with the, the cover letter addressed to the person. It's pretty much the same thing by email. You're attaching the cover letter and you're attaching the, uh, uh, the resume, you know. Which one would you prefer, email it or text <laughs> You know, at, at, at this point, I think most school districts, at least in my area in New York, have gone the, uh, the email, the electronic uh, route. For, for doing it. But there's no harm in, in, in also, if you do, you know, if you do blanket mailings, if you're looking at a geographic area, that's a time when you can still stuff the, the paper in the envelope and send it. You know, very, it, it's more now when you're applying to a specific position that they might want it, at least in New York, uh, by the email. You just have to see. You have to see what the culture of the different places is. Any other question before we interview? <laughs> All right. Now, now it is uh, time to interview. You've done your cover letter. You've attracted attention. They've read your resume, and they would like to know more about you. So, what is this about interviewing? Um, what do you? What's necessary to do? What's? What are the keys to a successful interview? In my experience, uh, and in my students' experience, the first thing I like to think of an interview. 
like a formal dance. Uh, you know, like one party is the leader and one party is the follower. You know, like ballroom dancing. And guess who's the follower? <laughs> you, okay? And the leader is the employer. And this is important to remember because uh, the, the people who are interviewing you set the stage, they set the pace, they set the questions. You have very little control over most of those things. Where you have the control is how you follow in the relationship, how you follow in the interview process. That's where you could be a master and, and really excel. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, the first thing to remember is, I think, to answer the question that is asked. I bet you didn't you laugh, but uh, I, I've, <laughs> I've interviewed many, many people, and I'll ask a question, and I'll get their term paper, you know, recited to me, you know, because it might have some connection. Uh, not everybody answers the question. Answer the question that's asked, and a way to help you do that, two words. This was given to me by the principal of Junior High School 51 when he helped me when I wanted to apply for a supervisory job. He says, start with two words. I would. All right. What would you do if your fourth grade students were, I'm going to be silly, throwing things at each other uh, during, during the chorus rehearsal and, uh, and things were out of control? How would you handle such a situation? Wrong answer. Well, my studies in behavior uh, psychology, uh, you know, uh, this psychologist says this, this psychologist says that. I would, whatever it is you would do. I would play three chords on the piano. I would slam the door. I would clap my hands three times if it was elementary school. What, whatever it is that you would do, I would. And then tell them what you would do. And that forces you to respond to the actual question and not to go off on a tangent. The worst, it's, it's terrible to go off on a tangent during an interview because it will annoy the interviewers and it doesn't really help them ascertain what you know and what, what, what your judgment is. Uh, so think of I would as a very good way to begin a response. Um, if you have several people at the table, I found it's a really good idea to work on your eye contact. How many of you, again, well, none of you are student teachers right now. Some of you are about to. OK, so a very important part of life is eye contact. <laughs> and a very important part of teaching is eye contact. And a very important part, why? Why? That's how you get their attention. You, you get their attention. What else? Yeah, you're interested in them, right? You're not just looking at your paper or looking at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually communicating with the people in the room. So that's important. Uh, at the interview, it's important too because uh, you want to divide up your eye contact between whoever's at the table. You could have a principal, an assistant principal, another music teacher, a parent. You could have all of them or some of them. And you've got these people and you're answering questions. So you start with the person, what's your name? Jazz. Jazz. <laughs> Say Jazz asks me the first question. I'm going to start my response looking at her. And then I'm going to go down to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. And back and forth as I, as I answer the question. Why am I going to bother to do this? For the reasons we said. But there's also another reason. Um, psychologically, if you don't acknowledge one of the four or one of the three, you can engender a negative reaction about you from that person, and they won't even know it. They won't even know it. But something inside them is going to say, she's not uh, paying any attention to me. Doesn't she like parents, if I'm a parent? What's the matter? She has a low opinion of parents. Uh, you know, or they don't think I'm important. I'm the principal. He's not even looking at me. Uh, and this could be subconscious. It couldn't, it's not necessarily they're going to say those words in their minds, but it could have an effect. So you want to give everybody equal attention. And that's a marvelous lesson for teachers when you teach. 
give all the kids equal attention and eye contact so that uh, everybody's drawn in and you don't let people start to feel neglected or inferior. All right? So that's something I think is very valuable to think about. Um, learn as much as you can, and this I'm sure you know, learn as much as you can about the school and the community before you go to the interview because it could help you, bless you, it could help you answer some of the questions. It could help you have an insight into why you might be getting some of the questions that you're getting. You should know the ethnic makeup of the school or the school districts. You don't have to know the exact percentages, but go look. <coughs> if you're applying to a small town school district, of which we have many outside of New York City and Long Island, the big suburb uh, with hundreds of school systems, tiny little school systems, uh, everybody paying very high taxes so their kids can go to that particular tiny little school system. Each town has a library. Each library has a town newspaper. Each town newspaper covers the Board of Ed meetings. You know, you could look if you're interested, and I'm sure that's the same thing down here. You can look and you can find out what happens, what's the issues in so-and-so Georgia or so-and-so South Carolina. You may be surprised what you find. You know, uh, you could find out that they're in financial trouble. Do you want to go there? You know, you could find out uh, all, all kinds of things that may be helpful or, or not to you. So it pays to research the community, the town that you think you might want to teach in and see if you can uncover stuff. When I went to, um, actually when I went to be the supervisor in East Meadow, I read something about them and it was half and half. It said that when, when they get together in the Board of Ed, they're really good for kids and education and then when they are divided, uh, things deteriorate, you know, so I, I kind of knew that there was a, a swing back and forth and it turned out to be the case. You know, I had five good years, you know, with a board of education that really valued the arts and then I had a couple of rough years, you know, when uh, they were trying to get rid of supervisors and things like that. So it, the prediction came true. What I read in the town paper uh, should have been an insight, you know, and maybe I didn't uh, take it as well as I should have. Uh, do not ask self-centered questions when the interview is ending and they say to you, do you have any questions? Right, they'll say that. They'll say, do you have any questions? And I'm going to tell you a, a stupid thing I did uh, a long time ago. I was coming from a job as director of music in Columbus, Ohio, where I had a hundred schools to oversee and teachers in all those schools. I was coming interviewing to a district on Long Island, a tiny town, North Babylon, and uh, in Columbus, we had trouble with the air conditioning in the offices, and we had to work in July and August, and I didn't like it. And I went to West Babylon, and I had the interview, which I thought went okay. And then they asked me, do you have any questions? And I said, will my office have an air conditioner? <laughs> and they looked at me, and well, I, I don't know, I think maybe, yes, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, well, needless, I didn't get the job, and I always wonder if it's because I asked a self-centered question like that, and they thought, well, you know, this guy's just interested in his comfort. You know, he's, uh, he doesn't, uh, that's his primary concern. You know, we're, we're not, that gives us a clue. People look, af look for clues. That gives us a clue, you know, to his character or something. So try not to ask self-centered questions. What kind of questions could you ask, do you think? Somebody different, yeah. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Hold that question. <laughs> okay. How does the hiring process go? You could ask that. That's an, that's, that's an innocuous question. Yeah. You could ask them how they feel about band boosters or you doing fundraisers for the program, I guess, outside of their financial help. I guess you can ask their views on it, like if they feel like that's okay in their system or not. You can ask that. As, uh, yeah, you can, you can say how does, how does the district work with the band, you know, how, how, do, how are band boosters funded in the district or something like that. You can ask that, yeah. Or we could ask like uh, what is expected of you, like what procedures or things that you have, like your program to do if you were over it at that school, like different uh, events. Yes, you can ask specifically, and I'll get, I'll get to these guys in a sec, you can ask specifically that kind of thing. You can say, what are the expectations in terms of scheduled performances? You know, what, what, that, that's a question you can ask. Don't ask, what do you expect me to do? 
<laughs> okay, but you you can make it, you know, and don't let it be interpreted that way. Right. You know, but 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 focus the question. You know, what what are the uh, what 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 are the annual, how many annual concerts? You know, what are the expectations for concerts? When do they occur? You know, do you have seasonal concerts? You know, what's uh, that? That yeah, I had one, two, then I have three. Oh boy, good. This is five. Good participation. <laughs> I'm going to hear them all. Who did I say was one? Okay, go. Uh, you can ask them what are the main goals of the whole music program? Like, and in the future, what do you want to? What kind of point do you want them to be at? You can ask them, but they probably won't know the answer. <laughs> um, you can. Let me think about that one for a minute. I'm going to get back to you. Who's two? Um, they're not music line. Could you ask, like, how long do you think it would, like, you would find out if you got the job or not? Leave it alone. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. So how would you know how long to wait? They will tell you generally. They will say okay. that you should hear from us in, uh, in whatever, a week or two weeks or this or that. And the next step is going to probably be a demo lesson if, if George is anything like New York. All right, and we're going to get to that in a second. Who's number three? Exactly where, like if I wanted to ask, okay, what things are you looking for from me that you didn't get from the past teacher? How can you ask that without exactly blowing up your head or bad mouthing the prior teacher? Yeah, that's a tough one. You might want to say something like, um, what do you feel is the music, how do you see the music teacher's role in the school community? Okay. That, nobody can hurt you for that. How, what do you see the music teacher's role in the school community? And then if they have something they want, you'll hear about it. And it's a great way of asking the question because it won't give them the opportunity to think, well, they don't know what they're supposed to do as a music teacher. But if you say something, what, is the role, what do you see as the role of the music teacher in the school community? They like that kind of stuff. So they'll, uh, they'll take that question seriously. Okay. That's good. All right. Uh, give me your question again. I want to make sure I get to it. Uh, I was asking, uh, what do you think? What, what are the main goals that you want the whole the whole general music program to reach, or like what point do you want to reach in the future? That's a question they should be asking you, <coughs> really. No, like what I mean is, say so like you uh, you're, you're part of the orchestra. The orchestra is only playing level four music, but you want to get by nature you want to play at a level five or something. Like, what point? What goals do you have set? Like, do you want to have set by a certain time? Okay, now we're focusing the question a little more. Uh, with regard, what do they call that system here? We call it NISMA in New York. What do they call it here? The, the state uh, rating systems? Is it like yeah. Georgia performance standards? You're talking standards? about the difficulty ratings of the music? Is that what you're talking about? Like level one grade? Yeah. Yeah. That go Band along with the... <laughs> the <laughs> I think, you know what? I think they're going to tell you yeah, I think they're going to tell you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would leave that one alone. I'm not comfortable with that question. Yeah, okay. Who was the next? Um, would it be okay to ask questions pertaining to a promotional advantage? Not yet, because the only, que the, only, the only answer you can find, you'll know in the state, in the state policies, it's probably... Uh, whatever it is in New York State, it's three or four years until tenure, uh, that kind of thing. It's going to be the same wherever, you know. So there's, it's, they're not going to tell you anything you can't find out. So I wouldn't ask that question. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, would it be okay to ask what happened to the guy before, like, just to make sure you don't like do it? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. To, it's a very good question. I say. Find out what happened to the guy before, but don't ask them. Okay. All right, find out what happened to the guy before, but don't ask them. All right, yeah. Can you ask questions? You know, sometimes along within the band director, you may have to some days be the choir director if they don't have one. You may have to have bus duty. Could you ask if there's extra jobs that go along with the band director job? You can if you phrase it diplomatically. Okay. You know, I think you could do that because you have a right to know what's expected of you. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions on that? All right, so you've, yes? Uh, what is the general discipline of the students? Like the behavior? Are they generally bad or? <laughs> 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 I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> Does your school have a, a 
codified discipline policy. <laughs> codified. In other words, is, does, does, you can ask them, does the school have a school-wide discipline policy? Does the school have a school-wide behavior code? That's better because it, you're not putting a judgment on it. You're not saying, are, you, are, are the kids bad? Are they good? Are they this? But you could say, does your school have, and then you could find out. They'll say, well, if they do this, we do that. And if they do that, we do something else. You know? So that's how I would approach a question like that. These are excellent questions. Um, any other questions on that point? Then we go on. Okay. They read your cover letter. They read the resume. You had your interview. You made your eye contacts. You answered the questions a lot of times I would. You didn't ask too many personal questions, self-interest questions. So let's say now you're on the list. And they call you back. My experience with all of my students is that they're going to want to see you interact with kids. They're going to want to see you do a demo lesson, what we call it. All right? And uh, a demo lesson is kind of an artificial thing because uh, the kids know that you're coming in to be interviewed. You know, it's no secret. They figure it out. Kids know everything. Uh, and um, it may be during the school year or it may not be. Okay, it could be over the summer. And they'll call in some kids. I've seen this happen in New York City. They'll call in the chorus, some members of the chorus, to be your people for the <coughs> demo lesson. And that's what you'll do. Um, the instructions will be vague. You won't really be given, most likely, a specific task to do. You might be asked to give a lesson to the chorus. You're lucky if they tell you that much. You know, uh, and, uh, or you might be asked to give a lesson to some gen a general music lesson. I've rarely seen where the requirements are made much more specific than that. So you have to be prepared with a lesson plan that's going to, in that's going to show student engagement and student activity. This is a good time to not give a lecture. You know, it's a good time to not stand up and just talk about a topic, whatever the age level is. But it's a good idea to get the students working productively, whether, <clears throat> whether they're learning around with an ostinato. You could do that for general music, elementary. And if there's some xylophones or glockenspiels <clears throat> and mallets, give them an ostinato to play. Have them create and perform something simple. Not complicated. Okay, the principal doesn't know much about music. Uh, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't have to worry about complicated. You have to worry about what works. You have to worry about are the kids going to get it and are they going to be able to do it? And are they going to be involved and interested in doing it? So you have to construct a lesson plan that's going to show those things. And then you go in and you give the lesson. Where the problem can come is if you have a group that's rather undisciplined for your demo lesson, uh, then you have to walk the fine line and you have to kind of have felt out the people, sniff out the people who interviewed you before and learn a little bit about the culture of the school. You have to kind of decide how much you're going to address and how much you might ignore. Uh, I've had a student who did a lesson plan and uh, some of the kids were not paying attention and when the principal asked me for a reference for, him, for the, that job, he said the only thing that concerned me, he says, was that there were a lot of kids you know, who were not engaged and he didn't address that. I could come up with another scenario with a different principal, with a different personality, <coughs> And if they felt that you spent the whole time on discipline, then they would feel that you were negative. So that's why I say fine line. 
you have to really, you have to make your own professional judgment in terms of, but the best recipe for avoiding having to make those tough decisions is to make the lesson as exciting and as fast paced and as routinized as you possibly can. You've heard these things before, I'm sure. Uh, so, so that there's minimal time for, for disruption of any kind. That's what you really want to do. And provide positive reinforcement. It's the best thing you can do, especially at a demo lesson. When you've not seen them before, and there's somebody who says something good, acknowledge it. Somebody's doing something good, acknowledge it. Uh, you, you never can run out of positive reinforcement. You never should run out of positive reinforcement because uh, there are enough people who deserve it. And there are enough people who, if you give that to them, they're going to try a little harder and they're going to be a little more cooperative. So positive reinforcement, as long as it's not ridiculously given. You know, I mean, if somebody's doing cartwheels in the class, you say, oh, that was lovely. No, uh, you know, but positive reinforcement, if they're sitting nicely, if they start to listen, if they do something you ask them to do, no matter how small, all of that is good, and all of that should be rewarded. And if you become a, a teacher who's very confident in that, you can be, feel like you're a master puppeteer in a way, you know, that uh, you're looking out on the whole sea of faces, and you're looking, as you do your lesson, you're looking at who's Who's doing the right thing? And I like the way you're sitting. And I, I like the way you answered that question. And all of these things. And all of a sudden, it's, it, you gather positive momentum. And uh, it's much better than issuing the negative signals, which rarely get you anywhere. So the positive reinforcement as you do your demo lesson is going to be helpful. Plus, principles, not that it's, we, we know it's good. And I kind of make fun of principles sometimes. But uh, <laughs> principles love to see that. You know, they'll write down positive reinforcement, positive reinforcement, students engaged, stud talk about buzzwords, students engaged, <laughs> students engaged. You know, and, but they happen to be good ones. So, uh, and that's what they know. They don't know how you do it. You know, they don't know what the ingredients are, but they can see, they don't know the musicality, but they can see that. That they're able to see. So you should make sure they see it. All right? And then that helps you in your interviewing and in your demo lesson. Did I miss any questions? Yeah. I was going to ask, usually how long is a demo lesson? It varies. It could be the equivalent of a class period in a high school, 40 minutes. It could be half an hour. I don't think it would be much more than 45 minutes. The kids couldn't take it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think that would be enough. 45 minutes, 40 minutes maximum. Maximum. All right. Yes. Besides the um, students, would this be the first time that they had the person that's Auditioning or whatever for the position would this be the first time that they would be exposed to the facility that they're teaching in? Well, yes. In, in terms of that classroom, they probably would not have seen it before. That band room, that they'd be in the principal's office for the interview, for the first interview. But uh, when it comes time to do the demo, probably the first time you'll see it would be when you do the demo, unless you ask if you can check out the room. And they might, they might figure that, that that's a good sign. You know, that, that you like to plan, that you like to see. And if they want to show you the room, they'll show you the room. And if they don't get back to you, don't worry about it. And just go and check out the room when you get there. Uh, we, I should just tell you a funny story very quickly. When I was in Long Island, I had a band crew of teachers, a crew of band teachers, that was really sadistic. And when they interviewed a new band director, here's what they did. And it'll never happen. After you hear this, no demo lesson will phase you. Uh, what they would do is they would prepare a score and have the kids learn it. They would not tell the candidate what the score was. The candidate would arrive for the interview. They would give him a copy of the, or her a copy of the score, give them 15 minutes in a closed room, and then bring them out to the podium. Would you like that? <laughs> they were very tough, you know, and that's, that's what they wanted. They wanted to see someone who could look at the score, having never seen it before, go out on the podium, run that band practice. I, I thought that was extreme, but that was the culture of the school district that I was working in, and that was important to them, and they, they felt that that would help them select the teachers that they need. You'll never see that. 
<laughs> Unless you go to East Meadow, Long Island. All right. Have you ever heard, I heard this is an incident where some, some have done this, like doing an audition, where the, uh, you know, the banner is there now, like they'll go tell the student, like in the band, to act up. Or to tell them to act out just a little bit to see how they can. I never heard of that. Yeah, I've I've heard where some they'll actually tell them to see how they can, you know, actually, you know, handle the situation in the in the right way and everything. Like not act out too much, but act out, you know, like slightly, just probably talk, like keep talking or something. Like why they're supposed to be playing or anything like that. Like, so all right, so what would you do in that case? How would you say they were just talking? What would you do? Uh, well, I, I probably would, you know, ask politely first, just stop, you know, stop, keep playing, ask the person politely to stop, please stop talking while I'm, you know, while I'm conducting um, uh, a practice. That's good. I have two preliminary steps for you, uh -huh. all right, before you did that. First thing, I'd look them straight in the eye as I'm talking, right. all right? Second thing, I'd move <laughs> towards them a little bit as I continue to give the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> then if that doesn't work, Johnny, stop. <laughs> That's good. I like I like what you brought up. Okay, folks. Now you've 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 aced your interview. You've aced your demo lesson. You got the job that you want. How are you going to succeed in your first year? at the job, and I have a couple of suggestions for you. Uh, the first thing is watch, make sure to cultivate your relationship with your supervisor and with your colleagues. Learn how you can help your principal. That leads back to the comments about how do you see the role of music in the school community. You know, sometimes they'll want to have some events that are more than just concerts, uh, you know, that they might have a, uh, a, an assembly. The, do they have the D.A.R.E. down here that they used to have? Uh, about the, the drug prevention, yeah. Okay, so, so you might have an assembly for that and they might, they might want the, the chorus performing. And what do you do? You say, yes, I'll help, you know? You don't want to be too elite and you don't want to say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't fit with my repertoire, that doesn't, uh, it, that's not how you, you, you gain traction in the school community. You want to help through music as and when you can and, and, and when you're asked. Work with your colleagues. You can learn a lot from them and they can help you. We had a situation in my junior high school where we actually provided a safe haven in our classroom for anyone who was acting out in another classroom. And it was very interesting. You should pursue it if you, if you get a teaching job and develop relationships with colleagues, we found that a kid who for some reason one day hated my guts, um, my colleague next door, I would say just spend a little time with Mr. X. They're happy to get rid of me, you know, because for whatever reason, you know, they see red, you know, when they look at me that day. They go to Mr. X, they're quiet as a lamb, you know, because it's, and he sends me once in a while, somebody. It's an amazing technique. You know, because it takes, the, uh, it takes whatever the tension was that the kid perceived in relates to, to me or the other colleague, and it, it disembodies it because it puts the kid in a different room with a different person, and it's gone. You know, they're very, uh, I've, I've had troublemakers that they sent to my room, then they want to they, they, they get the word sheet, they want to start singing the song. You know, and they were, they were, they were devils in the, uh, in the classroom next door. So you can work with your colleagues and you can help each other a lot. Communication with parents. Very important. You will find the last page of your handout has a little guide that was prepared by the staff of Junior High School 51 where I worked years ago. And it's a list of negative expressions and slightly more positive expressions. Just look through it for a moment. It's very common sense stuff, but it addresses the positive. You could say a student is lazy 
or you could say she can do better when she tries harder. You, you could say he's disruptive or you could say he should listen more. Don't say he must do this. You say she should do this. It would be helpful if she could do this. If you have, if you have a policy of calling home and you have a problem child, are you calling home about them? Try not to start the conversation negatively. Try to find something positive to say about the child. There has to be something. And then, uh, <laughs> then you go on and say, but we're having a little trouble in this area. And maybe I think if she did this, it would help. Could you help? Could you work with me? 95% of the parents will be cooperative. Whereas if you call them and you say, I just can't take it anymore. Uh, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim just doesn't know how to sit down. You know, whatever, whatever it is that your complaint is, the parent will get defensive. When you bring them to parent-teacher conferences, which I'm sure you have down here, like we have up there, um, you get time to interface with individual parents. Who are you going to see? Well, you're going to see a combination. You're going to see the ones whose children are doing well. You're going to see the ones whose children are having a problem. The same rule applies. And a principal once told me, remember, when you deal with parents, that they may be coming to you with bad memories of school. This is an interesting thing to keep in mind. They may, be, they may have been the world's worst students. They may have been a troublemaker. They may not have gotten along. They may have hated school. All right, and when they come back for the parent-teacher conference and they come into that school building, the whole history that they've had with school comes back and bites them, you know, and, and they feel very ill at ease and not at home and uncomfortable there. And then you add that to the mix, your child just isn't cutting it. You know, that's, uh, yeah. you have to find a better way. You have to find a more positive <coughs> approach to work with them. And we've been offered all kinds of ideas from don't sit directly behind the desk because you look too uh, authoritative, put the chair on the side, you know, meet the, meet the parent in the same space, you know, but whatever it is, whether it's a physical arrangement of chairs or whether it's the way you talk to the parent, uh, whatever it is, it's the same idea. You want to make them feel as comfortable as they can and you want to make them feel that you're there to help them and their child which you are, and that you were, you're there to work with them, and not to, not to challenge, but to, uh, to improve. So that's, that's a very useful thing. And I had colleagues who, who bombed at parent-teacher conferences, who ended up having fights with parents, and parents complaining to the principal about them. And I remember that, and I saw that, and I said, I'm going to work harder at uh, you know, doing this psychological stuff so that I can uh, see if I can get the parents on my side. Any questions about parents? All right. Much of the information and more that we've talked about today can be found in an article I wrote in the NISMA New York State School Music Association School Music News called Parents as Partners. And it was also on the NAFME website up until recently. I don't know if it's still there or not. And in an article in the magazine Teaching Music, put out by NAFME, uh, also Parents as Partners. I think it was about 2008, which you could find. It's a little bit of an old article, but parents haven't changed. Um, <coughs> Any other questions or things that you want to discuss? All right, you've been a one. Yes. Oh, sorry. This is just a quick question for you, right? <laughs> um, I know now that people are very um, open to talking about their kids and their kids. Does that matter if they're the same age as the people that are in your resume and all that stuff together, or should you take it separately and uh, present it all at one time? If you're putting it in an envelope, Put the cover letter by itself, staple pages one and two of the resume if you've got two pages. But don't staple the cover letter to the resume. Okay. 
at what point, I guess, like, in the resume or the interview or the interaction with the students, at what point do you really take the time to show your teaching philosophies? They will ask you. They will probably ask you. It's a very good question. They will probably ask you or may ask you at the interview. That, is the, I, that I think, is the time. Okay? They might say, they might, what is your philosophy of music education? And then every one of you should, and probably has already, prepared a little for assignments, uh, a philosophy of music education, and you can explain what that is to them. Your philosophy will also be apparent in how you conduct yourself with the classes. If you believe in group learning and you have group activity for your demo lesson, if you believe in hands-on creativity, if you have them create an ostinato, it's going to come across. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I learned this while I was at my high school. And in order to get a job there, you have to audition. So say like you had to do that for another school that you want to get a job for. What kind of things would you stand out for an audition? Oh, if you had to audition, what would stand out? I would say a, a contrast, two contrasting pieces. You know, whatever it is that you do. What, what is your instrument or uh, voice? So. Okay, so play something uh, classical, something from the Romantic period, or something classical, something contemporary. Yeah. I was saying, like, are there, are there certain names that you should play something by? I guess it's better <laughs> to play something by a, a fairly well-known <laughs> composer. But I would, as long as it's standard repertoire, I wouldn't worry. The principal's not a musician. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, that's when it's good to know that you have a supervisor, that you have an assistant principal, that you have a principal. I'm th you brought my mind back to 1980-something when I had a parent there who was just, and you know, it was one of the s richest spoiled kids in, in that public school. And what he did was during the day, he went down at lunchtime and he, he tore awnings off stores, you know, and uh, he, he literally, you know, tore awnings off stores and, and did vandalism. And his mother came to the conference and I, I said, well, I, that's not my concern, you know, because it was, but he was terrible in my class. So, and I, I found other teachers who said the same thing. And I, I told her the problem. And she says, you've damaged my son's self-esteem. <laughs> she says, you've damaged my son's self-esteem. She says, I won't have this. You know, and so she was really very angry at me. And I, I, t I repeated what I had said, and I showed her you know, some commentary from another teacher, and she said, this is just intolerable. You know, so I said, I suggest, with all due respect, I said, I suggest you speak to uh, Mr. Schlar, you know, the principal. He's in his office now, you know, and he can, he can help resolve this. So off she went, and he was a master. Whatever he did, I don't know. But, uh, but it never came back to me. You know, if, 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 if it's a real situation that you feel you can't make progress, that's what the supervisor is there for, that's what the guidance counselor is there for, you know, don't let it escalate. Send them to the, pleasantly and, and politely refer them to the next level. Uh, one, so many questions. Oh, that's good. No? children are in the band program or music and they enjoy it, but some parents don't value the program. How do you kind of get them on board to help or get involved? You know what I'm saying? Just more encourage it at home, just like they would school as a whole. I guess visibility is one key. I mean, visibility in terms of, uh, of appearing at different places, being invited to uh, uh, events, competitions, this sort of thing. Maybe invite them to a rehearsal, have an open rehearsal. Speak to the PTA. Ask to be scheduled at a PTA meeting as a new teacher so you can tell them all about the band program, how excited you are, and what it does for their uh, kids. <coughs> that kind of thing. All right. One, two. One, two, three. All right. I'm sorry, this is my last question. Okay, I was going to ask afterwards, but since she brought up the whole philosophy of. Um, education and stuff. So we have to take as an educator, music education major, we have to take these foundation classes and you know they talk about all that progressivism and all that kind of stuff but 
um, when we really talk about our uh, philosophy of music education, does it have to have those, um, like those words. terms and stuff <laughs> like that in our music philosophy? You know, I say at this point you have enough knowledge of your own of the different methods and philosophies and methodologies that you don't really have to parrot anything. Mm -hmm. But um, if you believe in group learning, say it. Okay. You know, if you believe in constructivism, say it and explain why. Okay. You know, but but don't parrot. You know, I mean, that's uh, yeah. make make it your own. Internalize it. Uh, who was two? <laughs> okay. What would be considered uh, an acceptable re a reference if they ask for references when you want to get a teaching job? <coughs> Cooperating teacher, excellent <coughs> reference. College professors, excellent reference. They're the best. Those are the best references for you. Yeah. Three. Who was three? All right. Uh, I know she had the question about uh, if the parents didn't really care as much about the student being in the music. But I've had some situations, I met some people where the student wasn't really that engaged, but because their parents were really into music, they kind of forced them to be <coughs> into a music program. Do you think, is it, is it better to try and reason with the parents or just try to find ways to engage the student? Ah, uh, that's a good one. Um, I would say that if you can find ways to engage the students somehow, you come out the winner. Any other questions? I want to tell you that you've, you've been a lot of fun to, uh, to work with. I hope that, uh, that some of what I, I shared with you uh, will help you in your careers someday. And I thank you again very much for inviting me down to Albany, Georgia to, uh, to be with you. And if you're into choral singing, I'm giving a workshop from 7 to 9 featuring arrangements of folk songs from around the world that I've arranged for middle school voices that feature parts that are ac accessible and doable by middle school boys. That's one of my little special niches that I do. So if you're around and you're able to come, I'd love to see you again. All right. I'm sorry? Of the book? We Shall Overcome, Essays on a Great American Song. Important chapter by Dr. Weber. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Take care. <laughs>